my name is Sam and thanks for checking out this video. Make sure to hit the subscribe button down below, hit the bell notification, and give the video a thumbs up. So I want to talk about the books that I read this week and also one that I read last week that I somehow managed to forget that I read to review. Well, it was because it was like an audiobook only because I put a, yeah, I just like, I looked at my bookshelf and it obviously wasn't there because it's an audiobook, so... So the book that I forgot to tell you about reading last week was Hocus Pocus, the original and the all new sequel by A.W. Jansa, I think is how you say it. This was interesting. I borrowed it from the library. I tried to get a physical copy, but there were three copies and about 30 people on hold. So that was not going to happen during the month of October, especially, which is when I wanted to read it. So I went for the e audiobook, which is why I forgot about it because it wasn't on my bookshelf. So it is, as the title suggests, basically a novelization of like one of my all-time favorite movies ever, Hocus Pocus, and then a sequel kind of attached. It's about two-thirds of the size of the bookish, I'd say. And yeah, so it follows the you know, the, the plot of the movie. And then a couple or a couple decades or later, it follows the child of the couple in the first movie. So I actually went into this very, very hesitant, A, because movie to book adaptations, I feel like they don't always go over quite as well. And when you do a book to movie versus movie to book, a book always has like extra things that help like develop the characters that a lot of the times doesn't or gets cut or just can't translate to a movie. Whereas I find when movies get translated into books, they literally just write down like the bare basics and they don't delve into that. And I feel like the book did kind of suffer a little bit from that, especially as someone who I was listening to the audiobook. The audiobook is not great, especially when you're in the original screenplay of the movie. The narration wasn't as good. The cast wasn't like particularly like unique or I don't even know why they weren't able to because they're doing like a 25th anniversary of Hocus Pocus. I'm kind of surprised they weren't able to get the original cast to do the narration, at least of the original screenplay. So I feel like that automatically like kind of just like, ah! so story wise, it was like a four stars. The not the audiobook though, I probably would gear you towards just reading the traditional book or an ebook version instead. I do want to say though, I liked the sequel. I was surprised. I was ready to be like, all right, tear it apart. Like this is going to suck. But actually there's Sarah and Mary. And oh, Winfred's there too. Actually wasn't terrible. I enjoyed it. The, like the child of them, of the characters from the original Hocus Pocus. I, I actually liked that. There was a little bit of mystery that readers knew about, but the kids didn't know about. And then you have kind of the reappearance of some of the old evil characters. But the way it ended, there's potential for a sequel of the sequel. So I'm very curious to see if that's actually going to happen. And if like Disney's just going to make it kind of like a series to just start publishing books, because they seem to have been doing that. And kind of just make it like almost kind of a separate extension of the franchise. I ended up giving it, I think, a, th a four out of five stars. And like I said, the real drama is just, is something that I think a lot of books suffer from if they are movie to book versus book to movie adaptations. Then I read Girl at the Grave by Terry Bailey Black. This book I honestly hadn't really heard of. And then the author is going to be in TBR and Beyond to do like a Q&A. And so I was like, all right, I'll give it a go. Read the summary. It's like small town, lots of like a murder mystery-esque stuff and family drama and hidden sort of stuff. And I was all like, oh, that sounds kind of like perfect for october -y. So I gave it a go. It is a slower paced book. I will totally admit that. However, I am someone who thoroughly loves like historical fiction mysteries and YA. I feel like it's like, it's, it's not, there aren't as many of them as I wish there were. I absolutely adored this book. I want to get my own copy of it. Um, because you can see this is a library copy. The main character is great. There is this romantic triangle going on throughout it, which I'm not always a fan of, but I actually liked this, this, how it was used, the different like classes of each of the characters and how they treat her differently. I specifically loved how it ended for the main character because throughout this whole, I'm not going to say how, but through this whole book, she is going through like her family has been kind of like outcasted in society because her mother was accused and hung for murdering one of her neighbors, which in a small town is like 
Yeah. And of course, the neighbor that she murdered and her mom apparently were having an affair and she's finding out lineage reveals about herself. Her father is super absent. She's helping this woman in the town who has mental disabilities. And in this time period, it's a historical fiction. You know, that's it's she's protecting her as much as she can. And then there is her going to a school that has been essentially forced by funding that they have to start accepting women and not everyone in that school wants women to get an education and all of this is just kind of piling on and kind of poking holes in the romance that she has with like her childhood friend who everyone assumes she's going to marry as well as the romance she's having with the son of the guy who her mother murdered so like there's all of this but the ending was so freaking perfect and i absolutely love that the author took that direction i was literally reading the whole book and i was like wait why doesn't there's more than just these two options you need to think and i know it was just my like 2018 feminist brain but and i got to the end of it and i was like oh my god high five this author i love her so i'm definitely going to reread this every once in a while i'm definitely buying my own copy and it did give me some vibe of actually of odd and true by cat winters which is another like very creepy kind of paranormally well that one is more paranormally and it it just gave me all the vibes that I loved from that book. So I feel like I've hit this like wonderful wheelhouse now of a couple authors of historical fiction mysteries with like strong women that the book is about more than just them having a romance of like Romeo and Juliet style star-crossed lovers. So highly recommend this book if you like female characters who are not like outrageously feminist. Like you're like, I love feminist characters, but if you're reading a book and you're like, this is set in the like 1600s, there's no way she would have been alive and said this stuff. Like, it's just not possible. But the main character is like realistic for the time period and she's smart and intelligent and strong and trying to decide on like where her status is in society with, with class, but as well as how people view her. And it's just so good. I absolutely loved this ending. And yeah, I just can't say enough positive things. Then I read Small Spaces by Catherine Arden. I was so curious about this one. This is another one that the holds list was so long at the library and there were only a handful of copies. So I wasn't going to get to it. So I had to go audiobook. But I once again read it, loved it. And hopefully I'm going to pick it up either myself or I might be getting it for Christmas. I think I put it on my list actually. So maybe that'll happen. But it is the first middle grade book by the author who wrote The Bear and the Nightingale, which is another series that I freaking, well, only two of the three books are out, but I freaking love that series. It's set in Russia. And the third book is coming out in January, I want to say. So this was kind of like a nice, like, pick me up because I really do love this author's writing, Catherine Arden, even though she's debut somehow. I really, really love her writing. But I am someone who, like, I'm terrified of a lot of things, especially like the time of Halloween, just like, irks, like, just like, in a, like, in, I can't deal with Halloween. Clowns scare the bejesus out of me. I've literally passed out when I've had to interact with them before. And anything to do with that I could even distantly relate to clowns is just a no-go for me. <laughs> so it was a little bit hesitant, but I figured it's a middle grade. It can't be that bad. And I will say that essentially scarecrows are just clowns. I'm just going to be real. Scarecrows are just vegetarian clowns. Like that's, let's be real. That's what they are. However, this was really cool. And the book was not about scaring you. So it follows our character. She's a little bit, I don't know if special is the right way to explain her, but like her mom has clearly passed. They don't explain how until about like three quarters ish of the way through, but she's clearly going through some grieving and her and her father, they're just trying to get themselves kind of back together since losing the mom. And she's very outspoken and very blunt and incredibly smart, but she's kind of gone into seclusion with this loss and she's a little bit antisocial. And right at the beginning on her way home from school, she kind of interacts with this woman in this very weird setting and kind of steals the book from her that this woman is like kind of like zoned out saying she has to destroy is very weird and then like a couple days later she goes to, with her school on a field trip to a local farm and the woman that she had stolen the book from is actually the farm owner and all of a sudden the bus breaks down and they're scarecrows and everyone essentially gets like absorbed and becomes scarecrows and then a watch that her mother left her starts giving her directions on how to escape and it's just it's like there's that adventure element. It kind of reminded me a little bit of Spelled by Betsy uh, Chow, is it? Betsy Chow. As well as like come kind of some elements of like Once Upon a Time. But it was still like very Halloween-esque. But it was still also about grieving and her growing up and trying to make the decision of like if, you know, this 
all people think of it. Like, if you could get your mother back, would you get her back? And, you know, the living versus, versus the dead, sort of, like, how you live with those worlds. It was just honestly very, very, very sweet, almost, despite being vegetarian clowns. <laughs> so yeah, I think I ended up giving that a five out of five stars. I whipped through it in like two hours or something like that. Then I read Toil and Trouble, the anthology put together and edited by Tess Sharp and Jessica Spotswood. I, you will notice on here, it says the 16 tales of women in witchcraft. Um, it was officially published with 15 though. One of the authors that was in here uh, in the arc was ousted in the um, big sexual harassment blow up, I guess is the word, that happened uh, in children's literature quite a few months ago now. Um, so they didn't, they removed her and didn't publish her. And for that reason, I chose not to read that story in here as well. I mean, it's not financially supporting it. I got an arc. However, just like knowing what I know, I don't want to read the author as well as like, there are authors that like, people read and then they find out later are hella problematic and they go through this inner turmoil of like, do I separate artists from work or like, where's the lie? I just don't want to do that to myself. I've never read anything by her and I don't plan on it. So I'm just going to write her off automatically. So I read 15 of the stories of witchcraft and women. I will also say this book had so much representation for LGBT. It was wonderful. It wasn't like, oh my God, there's a gay witch. It was like, I'd say like almost half of the stories really uh, had witches where, and they, I, I actually kind of liked this part of it that they didn't really label, attach a label to every single one. A lot of them, you were like, okay, so this person is either a lesbian or bisexual or a pan, but you don't know. So you can kind of associate how, you know, how you see it. If you are someone who wants pan representation, you could see it as, oh, this person is pansexual like me, that sort of thing. I also loved the different cultures. There were some, especially, well, I think it was because heavily it stood out to me because of, oh, I want to make sure I say her name right. Zoreta Cordova. She wrote like Bruja Born. And, you know, there's different parts of Latin American cultures in here. And I just really loved that. There were some historical, there were some contemporary. There, it, it is about witches, but a lot of the stories also touched on topics like domestic abuse and like emotional abuse versus physical abuse and, you know, shame and guilt and just a bunch of different things. It was really, really cool. I don't think any of the stories were like excessively long or like annoyingly short. They all kind of got their point across. They all pretty quickly developed their characters. They went through like a problem or a plot and it was just, it was all tied up really nicely. And I think the best part was that the last one was my favorite. I, I'd so honestly give all of them like a four stars or so. And then the last one was a five star for me. It's the, oh, I want to make sure I say her name right too. Why They Watch Us Burn by Elizabeth May, which was one that had um, LGBT rep, but as well as like, it was almost like a sort of like concentration camp influence part of, you know, the Salem witch trials where they're like, or actually kind of reminded me a little bit of Throne of Glass, like taking women who don't fit and then putting them in like work camps where they have to meet quotas, kind of like the way the coal mines are in Throne of Glass. Or like we've unfortunately done some of that in our history too. I don't know why specifically, but that one just, I really loved it. But I felt that they all got better as the book went on. And the fact that I liked the last one the most was always a great way to end the book. And lastly, I feel like I'm going to get shot for this one, but... I attempted to read Carry On by Rainbow Rowell, and I actually ended up DNFing this book at page 163. Oh, dear Lord. So I know this is supposed to be satire. I knew going in that it's essentially a ripoff. Whether a good or bad, I don't know. But a ripoff of Harry Potter. I feel like all of the elements that I enjoyed about Harry Potter were removed, and then there were fan fiction stuff added to it, if that makes sense. All I got out of it was in the 160 something pages was our main character. It's sort of your Harry Potter character, even though I didn't really like him, <laughs> but he's an orphan and he's brought to this magical world, of course, in the UK and well, in the muggle world in the UK and he goes to school there and he shows up and there's kind of this Dumbledore-esque character who's not giving him all the information, but is there's clearly a war, kind of like a Voldemort situation going on. And people like the Malfoys are suddenly disappearing from the school. Parents are keeping them away so that they can, they think, essentially start, like, putting an army together to take over, you know, magic again. Which, you know, the way that, you know, pure blood, pure bloods want to get rid of all, like, the... You see all these connections, it's basically the same thing. Our main character, for some reason, is buddied, like, roomated with a vampire, and the vampire doesn't come back. While this, like, 160 pages of waiting for this character, he's like 
kind of got a girlfriend. They've been together, but he thinks she cheated on him with this Baz guy and they haven't talked. And then he's got a best friend. I just didn't understand that entire romantic situation there. And I, it felt like I was dropped in the middle of a book. Like I was reading this. I was like, there was a first book that I missed. It, it, it literally felt like being taken and put in the middle of like the third Harry Potter book and being like, here you go, figure it out. But we're taking all the parts that you like. Out of it. I'm sorry if you liked this book. I really did try. I, I, I know it, there's a lot of people that enjoyed it. It has like over four, four stars on Goodreads and there's like over a hundred thousand reviews of it. I wish I liked it. I did give it a try. I think it's something to do with the writing style as well from the things that I, I, you know, I put online, like I didn't finish it. And the amount of people that flooded me with like, oh my God, me neither. Oh, thank God there's someone else. But I think it also too, like it's blurred by Lev Grossman who wrote The Magicians and I DNF The Magicians as well. That was another boring one for me. So I think it's just the writing style of these authors. So Unfortunately, this was my first and probably last attempt at Rainbow Row. Yeah, it just didn't do anything for me, unfortunately. So, but I mean, that's why you borrow things from the library. So yeah, the cover is really cool though. And I know they announced, which was part of the reason I did read it, that they're releasing a sequel in 2020. But it's just not for me, unfortunately. Well, my bank account says fortunately, but. So those are all the books that I read this week. Let me know in the comment section down below what you read this week. And if you hate me for not liking Carry On. Also make sure to check the description box down below. I will link all of the books to the Goodreads pages and I will also link my social media. If you follow me, I will follow you back.